Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move to a new synchronization mechanism, a new synchronizer that's called a reader's writer lock. And I'll talk a little bit about the concepts of reader writer's locks first, and then I'll talk about stamped lock, which is the next thing we'll be using in our program. First, let's give a quick overview of a reader's writer lock. So it's a synchronization mechanism that's used to solve so-called reader's writer problems. You can take a look at reader writer problems that are described here. And the basic idea is you have a situation where some resource is read a lot, like a book, <laughs> but only written to infrequently. So it's going to be useful to do everything we're about to talk about. So the typical way this works is you allow concurrent read access in parallel, right? You let many things read. Um, and you force exclusive writer access. So as long as there's only readers, they can all go in parallel. But the moment that something comes along that needs to write, then you typically need to get everybody else out of the critical section, let the writer do its thing, and then you can go back to letting more readers in or more writers. So it's typically used in contexts where many concurrent threads access a shared resource. So you've got some shared resource or a pool of resources, and you can allow multiple threads to have read-only access. They're not actually consuming anything or changing anything. They're just looking at it. Um, but only one thread at a time can actually make a change. Java supports two types of reader's writer locks. One is called reentrant read-write lock, which is the sort of old legacy way of doing things that turns out to be really slow. And then there's also something called a stamped lock, which is the newer Java 8 super duper fast, cool way of doing things. We're going to be focusing on stamp lock. Reader writer mechanisms may help improve performance under the right circumstances. In particular, in situations where resources are read way more often than they're written to. If, if you have a scenario like that, then reader writer mechanisms are good. Uh, we'll talk more subtly about the details. This is especially true on multi-core or multi-processor platforms where you can actually have things go in parallel. If you're on a single core machine, there's not much point in having reader writer mechanism usually because there's only one thing that's going to be able to go on at a time. So you're not really getting a win. There are some tricky things to reader writer locks in practice. So one problem is they can lead to starvation. So they may not actually let you proceed. And that has to do with whether you give preferences to readers or writers, if there's a choice. They can also be much slower than other synchronizers. This is particularly true of the older mechanisms that are available in Java, the Java Rantant read-write locks. Those are really slow, and not, there's almost no circumstance under which they're useful, it turns out. Uh, that's why they've created stamp locks in later versions. And you can take a look at this link to find out some good comparisons between reader-writer locks and synchronized statements and stamp locks and so on. And it really gives you a good feeling for when they're a win and how much of a win they are. They can also be somewhat hard to program. And you'll see when we look at this that, oddly enough, the, the classic reentrant read-write locks are really easy to program. They're pretty much like programming regular locks. But the stamp locks are more tricky. And you'll get a feeling for why in the next assignment where you've got a chance to use them. Yes, Ann. Good question. So reentrant reader writer lock and reentrant lock both inherit the, the lock interface. Um, the difference, as the name implies, is the reentrant locks are not read write locks, so they don't differentiate between reads and writes. And the reentrant reader writer locks do differentiate between reads and writes. Um, and so they're, they're the same in the sense that they both support reentrancy, but they have different semantics in terms of differentiating between readers and writers. So. Oh, the reentrant lock is not slow and terrible. Reentrant read-write lock is slow and terrible, yes. Which is why they have stamp lock. All right, here's a quick human known use of reader, reader's writer locks. I think I might have mentioned this a while back. So, you know, at Vanderbilt, we have a course catalog, and that course catalog changes typically once a year. So that would be a great example of what you would want a reader, reader's writer lock for, because most of the time it's just up there for reading, and you want people to be able to read in parallel. But every once in a while, you know, that one time a year when they update it, someone has to come along and change it. And you wouldn't want people to sort of get the catalog as it was half uploaded, right? That would be very confusing. So you would use a reader's writer lock to lock it exclusively when you're updating it that one time. But the rest of the time, you would let all the readers go in parallel. That's a simple example. OK. So 
that's the end of that section. Okay, now that we've kind of talked about what readers, writer locks are in general, we'll kind of zoom in and talk about stamp lock, give you an overview. So this is a readers, writer implementation that came out in Java 8. It was really intended to fix the problems that were there with the earlier versions. Way, way, way more efficient and scalable than reentrant read write lock. When you understand the implementation, you'll see why. Uh, it does have a couple of tiny limitations relative to uh, reentrant read write lock. In particular, it's not reentrant. But other than that, it's just really cool. You have a class called stamped lock. This doesn't implement anything else. It doesn't implement the read write lock interface, doesn't use the abstract queued synchronizer doesn't apply the bridge pattern. It's just really stripped down and super fast. There are three locking modes in stamped lock. And these modes, as you'll see in a second, go way above and beyond what's in the reentrant read write lock. In fact, we're not even going to talk about reentrant read write lock in the class. I used to cover it, but it's just so lame uh, that it, it's pointless. I have a video that you can watch, which I put in the assignment 4B uh, skeleton index.html file, which gives you an overview of reentrant read-write locks if you're curious. But I would suggest that you, you know, forward through that and, and watch the stuff on stamp locks, which we're about to cover. So there are three modes. Writing mode. So writing mode basically uh, has a couple of methods associated with it. And what these methods do is they all return something called a stamp value, which is just a, a long, it's just a Java long. And internally, that long contains a version number and a mode. So it indicates whether it's reading, writing, or other stuff mode. You'll see the three different modes. And it also contains a version. And you'll see why it needs the version in a second. The write lock method will block until it can acquire the lock exclusively. So that's pretty much like a regular old synchronized statement in, in a sense. It, it's going to wait until it gets the lock. It also has something called try write lock. And what that does is if the write lock is available, it'll grab it immediately. But if it's not available, it'll return 0. So it'll say it's not available. And then there's also something called try write lock that takes time out value. And so you can wait for the, you can wait to get a write lock for up to a certain amount of time. So those are three operations. Then we have reading mode, right? So reading mode is typically called for multiple threads. Once again, there are three operations. Read lock will acquire the lock non-exclusively. What that means is, is as long as there's nobody trying to write, multiple threads can call read lock, and they'll all succeed at the same time. And however, read lock, that call, will block until it can get the lock for reading. Why could it not get the lock for reading? If somebody already has the lock for writing. So if the lock is already in write mode, and you try to get a read lock, then you block until you get the read lock. But otherwise, you get it really quick. Then there's also try read lock, which is a non-blocking call, which gets the, re the read lock if it's there, if there's nobody else who's writing. Um, if there's other people reading, you'll get it. And otherwise, it returns a failure value. And then there's try read lock, which is the timed version. And then the third mode, and this is the most interesting mode of all, this is optimistic reading mode. So you, you all know the joke about you know half empty and half full and all that kind of stuff. So, so optimistic reading are for optimists. It's for people who always see the glasses as half full. And this is the major difference between a stamp lock and a reentrant read write lock, is this notion of optimistic reading. So what the heck is optimistic reading? Well, there's two methods here that we're going to talk about. The first one, try optimistic read, is not going to block at all. What it's going to do is it's going to give you back something called an observation stamp. And this observation stamp contains enough information in it that it can be checked later at the appropriate time. We'll see when that is. Um, however, if the lock is currently locked for writing, in other words, it's in exclusive mode, then try optimistic read returns 0. So that says, couldn't get a read lock. You know, I tried, but I couldn't. So it's non-blocking if it can't get it. However, if the lock is not in writing mode, if it's in reading mode, then it'll get you back that optimistic read lock. Well, it's not really a lock. It's, a, it's an observation stamp. How the heck do we use the observation stamp? Well, we end up validating it. And so what it's going to do is, the way it's going to work, you're going to say, try optimistic read. It's going to give you back an observation stamp. 
you then do your stuff to go ahead and read from the shared state. And once you're done reading from the shared state, you then go and you say, please validate that nothing's changed in this period of time when I was reading from the shared state. So validate is basically gonna take the stamp that was passed back from trioptimistic read, and it's gonna say, was the lock put into writing mode during the period between when the optimistic read uh, observation stamp was returned and when I validate it? And if the answer is no, there was no optimist, there was no change, there was no write lock, then I'm done. I never actually had to acquire the lock. I never had to block or acquire the lock at all. So it's really, really, really cheap. The only thing that'll have to happen is that caches will be flushed. But other than that, it's super fast. If something changed, however, then validate will fail, it'll return false, in which case I've got to do something else. Right, so this, you can see why this is called an optimistic read. It, optimistically assumes that nothing changed, and if your optimistic assumption was proven to be true, then you pay almost no overhead at all other than just flushing caches. And only if you were falsely optimistic, then you do have to do some extra work to acquire the right kind of lock. And you'll see an example here in a second. So the, the good news here is if validate succeeds, synchronization overhead is absurdly low, and it's really just about visibility overhead at that point, pushing the values out from, the, from this particular thing to, to other parts of the, the system. Okay, so under what circumstance would optimistic read locks be a win? Can you think of situations where they would be a win? And then I'll reverse the question and say, when would they be a, a loss? Right, why would it be a situation where an optimistic read is gonna help you? Low uh, frequency of changes. Right, so low contention for writing. Absolutely, that's exactly right. Conversely, if there's high contention, if things are changing all the time, your optimistic read is actually bad because, that's not bad, it's not horribly bad, but it's gonna be more overhead because you will have thought you had the thing, you will have changed your data structures only to find out you have to throw it all away and try again, or grab a real, a real right lock. So it's a win in situations where there's low right contention. That's the fancy way of saying. All right, so let's take a look at an example. Oh, there's also one other set of things. These are the um, conversions across lock modes. And this is important because you need to do this for your homework assignment. So there's three operations for converting back and forth. So there's one method called try to convert to right lock. So this is called lock upgrading. So if you have a, a read lock, and now you want to make it a write lock, you can try to convert it to a write lock. If you succeed, it atomically acquires the write lock without much overhead, and you don't have to do anything else. So if the lock state matches the stamp, then here's what happens. If the stamp representing represents holding a write lock, return it. So if you try to convert a write lock to a write lock, it's already a write lock, so you're done. If the stamp represents holding a read lock and a write lock is available, then this method will atomically release the read lock and return a write stamp, so you very quickly upgrade it. If the stamp represents a read that's optimistic, return a write stamp if it's available, otherwise fail, because it's already, somebody else already holds the write lock. Yes, Philip. You don't care, <laughs> you as a user. All you do is you store the stamp in a long and then you pass it back to these methods. So you're always, that's how it knows what the stamp is. The implication by that, of that, by the way, is don't just randomly pass gobbledygook values into these methods, you know, chaos and insanity will re result. Then there's also a try to convert to read lock, which basically works the same way. If, it's a, if the state is a write lock, then release the write lock and atomically obtain a read lock, that's kind of lock downgrading. If a stamp represents a, a read lock, you're done, you already have a read lock. If it's an optimistic read, return a read stamp if there's one available, otherwise you fail. And then you can also convert something to the optimistic read, which again, does the same thing. So basically this is kind of lock super duper downgrading, you're downgrading to an optimistic read. There are also several ways to unlock a lock. You can essentially call unlock write, 
and that works if it was a write lock already. You can unlock read, which you can do if you know it's a read lock, and then you can just call unlock if you don't know what the heck it is, and it'll unlock it for reading or writing depending on what the actual stamp indicates. This one is the most general, but it's got a little bit more overhead. If you know what kind of lock you have, call unlock write or unlock read based on what it is. Yes, Ann. Uh, then it's bad, right? So if, if you get it wrong, you'll get an error. So that if you don't really know what it is, just call unlock and it'll keep track of that stuff for you. So unlock is less efficient, but it's a little safer. Okay, that's the end of that section.